Good morning, everyone. Welcome to class. Thank you for joining class today. We'll begin now. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Subhajit, can you please lead us in prayer? Oh, he's... Yes, ma'am. Sure. Subhajit. Father God, we thank you for this moment. Father God, for this class. Father God, we pray that Father God give us wisdom, knowledge and understanding, Father. That whatever we learn, we'll be able to grasp and apply in our day-to-day -day life, Father God. And Father God, I pray, pray for a lecturer, Father God, so that Father God uh, give her wisdom so that we can get revelation out of her from her from you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. I uh, place this time, this moment, uh, and this class into your hand, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Today we're looking at uh, Romans chapter 5. Uh, where Paul is talking about grace and righteousness and um, in the previous chapter you know he's been explaining to us um, or explaining to the Jews that it's not uh, by keeping the law which he starts back in chapter 3 it's not by keeping the law or the you know the circumcision which is the sign of the covenant that is going to uh, justify them or it's going to make them righteous in God's sight because uh, in spite of the law, in spite of um, the circumcision ritual that is um, a sign of covenant which was given to them uh, and the Gentiles, you know, their conscience in spite of God giving them conscience and everything, you know, he says that, you know, all have sinned. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then he says, you know, it's not, you cannot be made righteous in God's sight. You cannot be uh, standing blameless or faultless before God uh, by just keeping the law or uh, circumcision, but it is by righteousness, by faith. And, um, uh, and how does he, you know, uh, reason out what he's saying? Or how is he substantiating the truth that he's presenting? That it's uh, righteousness by faith, and it's uh, it's it's um, you know through grace by faith. It's and how do we receive it? Uh, uh, it's because he gives an example of uh, Abraham in uh, chapter four. Uh, you know, and he says, you know, Abraham even before God gave him, uh, you know the circumcision ritual as a sign of the covenant or even before the law was given uh, Abraham was justified by faith okay and hence uh, we also will be justified by faith faith in whom and then he goes on uh, you know he in the the last few verses in verses 22 to 25 he talks of righteousness by uh, faith okay so we are saved by grace through faith, you know, uh, 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 and it's a gift of God that we uh, receive it. Okay, and then he goes on in um, in, in chapter five to talk about, uh, you know, how we receive this righteousness by faith is because Christ was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Okay. And then he says in uh, verses 1 to verse 4, he talks about having been justified, what do we have? Now he's so far talking about how we've been made righteous, um, how we've been uh, justified. Uh, and uh, now since we've come to that position where he's saying that we have been made righteous, we've been justified by faith, uh, because of what Christ did on the cross, because he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Now that we have been justified, what do we have? So verses 1, 2, verse 4, can somebody read that place? Verses 1, 2, verse 4 of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope, hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Okay, thank you. Um, that, was, that was Asha, right? Thank you, Asha. Um, so, you know, uh, the words justified, uh, justified, justified, justification, righteous, righteousness, all means the same uh, thing because they all have the same root word and it simply means that we have been made faultless or blameless. Uh, we have, uh, you know, been made just as if we have never sinned before God. So what does it mean to be justified by faith? Or what are the outcomes of being justified by faith? And Paul says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, which means we have become one with God. We are no longer enemies of God. We are friends with God. We're in a good relationship with God. We're not in a fighting mode with God, but we are friends with him because we are justified with God. So, you know, sometimes we think that, um, you know, God is angry with us or God is upset with us, um, um, uh, you know, but that's wrong thinking, okay? We don't think like that as children of God, as sons and daughters of God. We don't think like that because the word of God says here that God has peace with us, okay? Um, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So never think that, you know, God is angry with you or he's upset with you um, because it, his word says that God has peace with us. And in verse 2, it says, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the uh, of uh, the glory of God. Okay, so the outcomes of being justified are mentioned here in verses uh, 1 and verse 2. It says, we have peace with God, which means we are one with God, we are reconciled to God, we are not, we're no longer enemies of God. Uh, we are not fighting with God and also it can mean that we have peace with God and we can have peace of God. Okay, we, we are, you know, we have peace with God. We are no longer enemies with God. We are friends with God and we also have the peace of God uh, that is there in our hearts. That's a characteristic of uh, the sons and daughters of the kingdom of God that we have God's peace. So in midst of the tribulations, turmoil, challenges, problems that we face, you know, we have this amazing sense of the peace of God uh, that we can experience. I don't know if you have uh, experienced the peace of God in uh, difficult situations. You know, the situation is so overwhelming, so challenging, so difficult, but then you can just, you know, experience an amazing peace of God. And it's just such a powerful, it's such a wonderful um, experience uh, to have, you know, and to know that in that situation, you just have that calmness, that peace of God. And it's just so, uh, it's just so wonderful. It actually uh, takes you to a different level in your experience with God. Okay. And the second thing is, uh, you know, um, uh, we look at four outcomes of uh, being justified uh, uh, of the, re uh, sorry, we look at four outcomes of being justified. Uh, first one is peace with God. The second one is we have an access of, uh, uh, by faith into a standing in grace. Okay. Uh, verse two says we also have, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So we have access by faith into a standing in grace. That means we are in a position where we are highly favored by God. Okay. We entered into this standing in grace. Uh, simply because uh, of our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done, uh, because what he has done on the cross, he has imputed his righteousness or put his righteousness into our account, so to say, and hence we stand righteous before 
God. So to be standing in grace uh, uh, to God, you know, we are loved as Christ is loved. That means, you know, uh, God the Father loves us just the way he loves his son. Um, I don't know if that blows your mind, but it does mine, you know, to just know that, you know, this God uh, loves me uh, just the way as he loves his son. And even when we are being justified, when we are made righteous in God's sight, we are standing in the same level as uh, as um, the son. God, the father has made us stand in the same level as his son. And I think this is not just something that we stand in awe of and uh, we just give glory to God, but it's something that, you know, it's not just um, a position that we can enjoy, but it's also a responsibility saying, God, you know, you've brought me to this place. Help me to honor and respect this, uh, this standing, this love, and help me, God, uh, to live like, a kingdom citizen to live kingdom culture kingdom lifestyle kingdom values kingdom behavior uh, let it be shown in and through my life okay and to be standing in grace also means that to god we are well pleasing before him now there are various scripture references that you can uh, there in your notes you can read uh, it's like the father speaking over us what he spoke over Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So when we have the right standing in grace means to God, we are well pleasing. We are fully accepted uh, by him. Uh, you know, we are blessed beyond measure. He, he has blessed us not only spiritually, but even physically, materially. He blessed us within, without measure. Uh, we are holy and without blame. Uh, you know, when we are justified or made righteous before God, you know, we are presented faultless and blameless. We are presented holy, okay? And we are faultless, unaccused, and there is no condemnation, um, you know, and uh, it says in Colossians chapter 1, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked words, works, yet now he has reconciled you in the body in his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. So it's because of Jesus Christ that we are being presented faultless, unaccused, and without any condemnation before God. And that is our standing in grace. So, you know, all of us are standing in grace, but we don't... Uh, uh, we don't know the uh, the reality or we don't know the truth um, of uh, our standing in grace. You know, what have we received, who we are to God or how God sees us. He sees us as, you know, he loves us just the way he loves his son. We are well pleasing to him. You know, we're fully accepted. We are blessed beyond measure. We are uh, faultless, blameless. We stand unaccused and no condemnation. Can we say an amen to that? Okay, amen. And uh, let's uh, realize our standing. Let's realize our position. Let's realize where God has placed us, uh, uh, where we stand in his grace so that, you know, we can um, glorify him by the life that we live and the, work, and the things that we do for his uh, kingdom. Okay. And we're also qualified, um, you know, um, we, um, he has qualified us to be his with Jesus Christ, we're qualified to be, uh, sorry, we have qualified to be heirs with God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. He has given us the keys of the kingdom, which means he has given us the authority of the kingdom. And uh, he's qualified us to take dominion and to subdue the world uh, and to initiate, to bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in um, heaven. So it says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Okay, There's not, uh, There is nothing more that we can add to this through our own efforts, but all we need to do is just embrace everything that you know God has given to us and walk worthy of this. And um, you know, therefore he says, therefore all we do uh, in verse, um, uh, you know, in he says that therefore in everything that we do, you know, we need to be mindful of how we relate to God, uh, you know, how we face the devil, uh, all we do in Christian ministry, everything that in we do in life is flows out of our standing in 
grace. Therefore, all that we do, you know, how we relate to God, how we face the devil, uh, how what we do in ministry or whether we are uh, uh, working in the secular world, everything flows out to our standing in grace um, and we stand without any sense of guilt and shame. Okay. And so the reason we live holy lives, we renounce sin and ungodliness, we work hard, we pursue excellence, we make sacrifices, we take risks, uh, it's not to you know earn anything from God, but because we desire to honor Him. Uh, we want to give Him the best we can, all out of uh, you know love for Him. Uh, and we already know where we are standing in grace, and uh, uh, we and we know that whatever we do, you know, uh, uh, we won't earn that it, it won't earn us His grace because we are already standing in His grace. But it will actually empower us. Okay, His grace will empower us. Remember, I I mentioned uh, the three contexts that grace is used in the uh, in the New Testament. Um, we saw uh, divine favor. You know, it's the character of God and divine empowerment. Okay, so uh, nothing that we do um, for God is going to actually earn us grace. We've already received His grace; it's His gift, um, His goodness, His mercy upon our lives. But actually, you know, when uh, we renounce sin, we live holy lives, we pursue excellence, we make sacrifices. You know, um, we do it because we want to honor him for the for what he has done in our lives, for his grace, for the right standing, for us being made righteous and being justified. And we do it all out of love, and um, we do it so that you know we can be empowered uh, uh, by grace. We can all this we do is also because you know we are actually empowered by the grace of God. Uh, and we're doing it as an expression of our honor and love and it's all for his glory okay so even the lives that we live whether it's living a holy life a blameless life whether you're making sacrifices whatever you're doing for the kingdom of god it's actually even not in your own strength it's actually empowered by the grace of god and um, and we're doing it uh, you know, out of um, love for him, out of our honor for him, and also for uh, his glory. Okay. Now, the third thing that um, you know we um, outcome of being justified uh, mentioned here in this verse is the third thing is we are in a place of rejoicing. Okay, we are rejoicing for the good things that God has planned for us, um, and He's going to release upon us the glory that He has kept for us. Uh, that's why Paul says the hope of the glory of God. Okay, we have this hope that we will share in God's um, glory, and part of this includes, you know, being in His presence in um, heaven. So there are already, you know, some things that we enjoy, like we has said that, you know, uh, meaning of standing in grace. What are the things that, you know, how God sees us? Um, and we already enjoy some of those things, you know, we have peace uh, with God, we have the grace of God, but there is more that God has kept for us. And so, you know, we need to rejoice in the hope that we will also receive uh, more of what he has kept for us, that we will receive that as well. So the third thing is we are in a place of rejoicing for the things that we already have, for the standing in grace, for the peace of God, and more that God has kept for us, that uh, and we rejoice in the hope that uh, you know we'll receive that as well. And the fourth thing is rejoice in tribulation, which means um, you know knowing that uh, you know all of this uh, results uh, uh, will result in developing endurance, uh, endurance character and character. Hope. So why do we need to rejoice when we go through tribulations, when we go through hardships, when we go through difficulties? Because uh, we look at the end result. What is the end result? It develops in us endurance, and endurance develops character and character, hope in us. Okay? Verse 3 he says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance. Okay, so when we go through hard times, uh, we can still be happy. Uh, when things are difficult uh, and hard, we are not down, dejected, or depressed. Uh, we glory in tribulations, knowing, 
uh, what do we know? You know, uh, we know that tribulation develops perseverance or endurance, uh, and it gives us the ability to stay the course, to run the race. Uh, and in verse 4, it says it produces character, and character increases hope. So even as we go through tribulations, it develops endurance, it develops our ability to stay on course, and we need to stay on this course so that our character is developed, uh, who we are as people is, is being developed even as we go through trials and tribulations. And when our character is developed, we become people of hope, uh, which means uh, we can look at the positive side of things even though we are going through tribulation. So hope is the expression of, uh, of us being a strong character. Okay, it means that we are people who have been tried, who have been tested, who have been proved. So even in difficult situations, we still can have hope. Hope will not disappoint us and we will not be disappointed uh, but because the hope will become a reality one day. That means what we are hoping that God will do will become a reality and hence we will not be disappointed uh, and uh, you know we will be uh, even though we are tried we are tested we proved we come out as uh, gold okay and then Paul goes on to say that the love of God has been poured in our hearts right now the love of God has been poured into our hearts that means we're experiencing the love of God uh, being poured out into our hearts and that's what he uh, you know says in verses uh, five to eight he says now hope does not disappoint because the love of god has been poured out into our hearts by the holy spirit whom he has uh, given to us okay so in tribulation uh, you know how should i be i should be a person uh, full of hope uh, why should i be pers a person full of hope or how can i be a person full of hope because god's love is in my heart i experience the love of god you know when we go through tribulations and difficulties we experience the the manifest um, glory of god that means who god is and what he does and you know uh, i'm not sure uh, you know or if you've gone through experiences tribulations in life but you can say in those situations in those difficult circumstances you've actually experienced god's love his peace his overwhelming peace it just floods your heart your soul your mind you've experienced his um, love you've experienced who he is and what he does uh, because he desires to manifest all of himself his glory you know um, when we go through hardships when we go through difficulties and it's a wonderful um, you know um, uh, experience just to taste of uh, his peace or to taste his uh, goodness and taste his love um, at that time to experience his love at that time so the love is, of god has been poured out in our hearts right now the love of god has been poured out in our hearts uh, we've been experiencing the love of god that he has poured out in our hearts here and now and it's the holy spirit okay who enables us to personally experience the love of God and walk in the love of uh, God. Okay, uh, it is also so that you know God's love is poured in our hearts. It's also so that we are able to love others. Okay, um, so God's love being poured into our hearts is not only uh, do I experience that love, but I'm able uh, not only able to experience God's love, but also able to turn around and say, God, if you love me. You know, such a sinner, such a fallen person, such, uh, uh, you know, such a worthless person as me, then, you know, you can turn around and say, God, you know, I can even love others, others who've wronged me, people who've hurt me, uh, people who I feel, you know, are not uh, worth giving the love, the respect, the regard. Uh, but God, um, it's because of your love that I'm able to love them. Um, so the to the measure that we experience the love of God, to that measure that we can extend the love of God to others. So, you know, um, when we've experienced God's love in spite of our faults, in spite of our uh, weaknesses, then we can say, you know, we can also love others in spite of their weaknesses, in spite of uh, their faults. So the same love that is poured into our hearts which we experience personally 
which makes us more than conquerors is uh, difficult uh, uh, which makes us more than conquerors in difficult situations which gives us uh, conviction that nothing can separate us from god's love the same love we extend to other people hoping that they too will feel or experience the same thing that we are feeling that they too can be more than conquerors in difficult situations and nothing can separate them from God's love. Okay, Prabhakar, you have your hand up. Do you want to uh, have anything to say? Hello, Prabhakar, uh, you have your hand up. Sorry, Pastor, it was actually uh, okay. a technical okay. mistake. Okay. Anyone has any questions? So verse 5, you know, can be understood both as the love of God being poured into our hearts, creating in us an experience, an intimate personal knowing, understanding, experience, feeling, sensing the love God has for us. And the love of God being poured into our hearts gives us the capacity or empowers us to love others as he has loved us, okay? Later on in chapter 8, uh, Paul describes to us how powerful this love is which God has for us, but I just mentioned some of uh, them here, you know, that we'll be, he mentions that we'll be made more than conquerors, that nothing can separate us from God's love, um, something that he writes uh, in verse chapter 8, which we will look at in chapter 8. But first here, he points the cross as the place where God demonstrated his great love for us. And he says, all this is possible because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Okay. He says, um, um, while we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay. And verse 8, he says, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, okay? So Paul is pointing us back to the cross where he's saying, God demonstrated his great love for us and all this is possible, you know, uh, having peace with God, uh, our standing in grace, uh, you know, the love of God being poured into our hearts, all because of the redemption that is in uh, Jesus Christ. It's all because that he redeemed us from sin, the price that he made on the cross. Now, verses 6 to 11, uh, Paul is focusing on Christ's death for us. He's uh, focusing on the cross. Okay. Uh, so can somebody read verses uh, 6 to uh, verse 11, please? Or you can just read from uh, verses uh, 6 to uh, 8. I'll read. Thank you. When you are still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. May even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much He loves us. It was while we are still sinners that Christ died for us. Thank, Thank you, you, Kennedy. So in verse 6, I like to emphasize three things here that you know Paul mentions. We were without strength. So he says, when we were without strength. Uh, and later on in this chapter, he will talk about how we come to a place of strength where we are reigning in life. So here he's actually uh, building up a contrast. Okay, he's just first mentioning, uh, you know, uh, that we are without strength. And then later on in this chapter, he talks about how we are brought to a place of strength where we are reigning in life. So when we are without strength, you know, we were weak, we were powerless. We were in slave, uh, or we were slavery to in slavery to many things, to sin, um, uh, to Satan, to death, and uh, this was our condition. In this stage, we were without strength. Now, the second thing I like to bring to or emphasize in verse six is, you know, um, 
at the right time christ died for us okay at the right time christ died for us now uh, just like a side note i like to just mention this okay when adam and eve sinned uh, it was after their sin uh, 4000 years had passed after 4000 years you know christ came and he died on the cross now why did it take so long uh, if uh, God already knew that Adam and Eve had si uh, were going to sin, he already had the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption. Uh, he had already a solution for it, even though it began, he had this, it was in his mind even before the foundations of the world. Uh, then why couldn't he have executed his plan of salvation, um, you know, the very next day after Adam and Eve sinned? So, you know, Christ could have just come and then he could have died. And there are only two people to save them and redeem them. Uh, but, you know, um, the third thing, you know, why why did God wait uh, for 4,000 years? You know, in that 4,000 years, people suffered and faced the consequences for sin for 4,000 years. But we see that scripture tells us at the right time, Christ died for us. Okay, at the right time, at the appointed uh, time okay in due time at the right time um, Christ died for uh, us okay uh, so 4,000 years in our mind is such a long time but for God it's the right time uh, we cannot understand everything about how God works and his timing uh, we cannot understand God's timing as well um, but we can say you know in that 4,000 years he revealed himself he brought about the nation of Israel, uh, he, he brought it into existence, he gave them the laws, he gave them the co covenants. Um, but if you look at the main thing to happen, that is Christ to come and die for our sins, it took 4,000 years. But we don't understand everything about God's timing, but we trust that he does everything beautifully in his own time, the right time, the kairos time. Uh, that he does the thing uh, that he has planned and what he wants to execute. Uh, he does that at the right time, the Kairos time. Okay. Um, uh, so the same thing, if you look at, you know, uh, Christ died and he ascended back to the Father. Now it's been 2,000 years since Christ died and we're saying Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon. So when is he going to come? Okay. We can only say one thing, that at the right time, Jesus will come. And we just rest in that uh, truth. We do not know when the right time is. Uh, when is the Kairos moment? He knows it. But we just rest in that truth. Now, this is just a side note. We'll continue with um, what we are uh, looking at in um, Romans chapter 5. He says, you know, uh, uh, Christ died for the um, and while we was uh, while we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, so you know, Christ died for people who really did not deserve it, and he contrasts this with what he says in verse seven. He says no one will give their life for an another good person. Okay, even if it's a good person, no one will be willing to give their life. Very rarely will somebody give up their life for a good person. Uh, but he says in verse 8 that this is what God did for us, that while we were still sinners, while we were still ungodly, while we were still without strength, God demonstrates his own love uh, towards us. So Paul is saying uh, this is not about us. You know, whether we are good or blameless, whether we are noble or whether we are worthy, uh, God is saying, I know that you are ungodly. I know that you are without strength. I know that you are sinners. I know that you are slaves to sin, a slave to Satan. But I love you so much that I'm going to show you that I love you. Okay, so this is how uh, God says, I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to show my love. He says, God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Us. And this is the love that, you know, he poured out in our lives, uh, which we read in back in verse 5. Uh, we know it. And here is the evidence, the proof that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. Sometimes, you know, we really feel that God really does not love me. We try to determine, uh, or God does not love us, or God does not love me. We try to determine or judge God's love by the nice things that happen to us, 
um, or uh, you know uh, if it's the wrong things then that happens to us then we think God does not love us but every time we uh, you come to a place where we question God's love we must you know we must always look at the cross you know we should never question God's love because it says here that God loves us loves us that he demonstrated his love but we are still sinners Christ died for us but you know, um, we need to look at the cross. So every time we want to know God's love for us, you know, we must look at the cross. And we must say, God, this is how much you love me. You gave Jesus for me while I was still ungodly, while I was still without strength, a sinner. Uh, you know, you sent your son and Jesus, you died for me. And this is God's demonstration of his love for us. Okay. And this should bring us that place to this truth that you know God loves us in spite of whether things are happening good in our life or bad in our life you know we need to have this truth engraved in our hearts that you know uh, God loves us and he is good all the time and we are the right standing with uh, in grace with him okay then Paul goes on to talk about if Christ died for me then what is the result he talks about this in verses 9 to 11. Okay, uh, so if Christ died for us, then what is the result? So can somebody read verses 9 to 11, please? I'll read. By sacrificial death, we are now put right with God. How much more then? will we be saved by him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Jesus Christ's life? But that is not all. We, are, we rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has now made us God's friends. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. So it says, because Christ died for us, we have been justified by his blood. We have been saved from the wrath, the judgment through him, and we are saved from eternal judgment. Okay, so because Christ died for us, we're justified, we're made righteous, we're saved from the wrath, that means the judgment that is going to come, eternal judgment uh, uh, the judgment through him and we're also saved from the eternal judgment and verse 10 he says for if when we were enemies so looking at the past we were ungodly we were without strength we were sinners now we are adding to the list you know he's adding to the list and says uh, we are enemies but we are reconciled to God so he's already said that we're ungodly without strength we're sinners and now he says we were enemies with God. He's adding to that list, but he says now we are reconciled to um, uh, God. Okay, just like to give you a small uh, uh, illustration here. Just imagine two friends, uh, James and John. Uh, imagine James has borrowed huge amounts of money from John, and and then you know John just turns against James, bringing all kinds of uh, false ac allegations against him, doing him much damage. Uh, but John has a choice. He can choose to retaliate. He can choose to ignore or choose to reach out to restore his relationship with James. Okay. Now imagine uh, John goes to James. He forgives his debt completely, forgets all the wrong things James has done to him and only asks for friendship to be restored with him. You know, uh, how amazing that would be. In a similar, you know, but in a far greater way, no, we were enemies with God. We were the ones who owed a great debt to him because of our sin. Uh, we were the people who were so hostile, we were so indifferent towards God. And it was God himself who paid our debt in full by giving Jesus. And God himself made a way for us to be brought into friendship with him and reconcile us to himself. So because we are reconciled, but also being saved from eternal judgment because of what Christ did for us. Okay, verse 11, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we have now received 
reconciliation. Okay, so in verses 6 to 11, Paul is saying uh, Christ died for us, uh, for us who are ungodly, without strength, who are sinners, enemies with God, but we are saved um, and we are brought into right standing of grace, we are brought into peace with God, and also we are saved from eternal judgment. Okay, in verse 12, he tells us more of what has happened. Uh, because of the cross. Now verses 12 to 21 is a very unique um, passage of scripture. We don't find it anywhere else other than in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul writes about it. Um, uh, he refers to this as identification. So every person is, uh, uh, you know, uh, is affected by one man, Adam. Uh, what happened to that one man, Adam, you know, affected the entire human race. Similarly, what happened to the other man, that is, he's referring to Jesus Christ, is also available to the rest of the human race. Okay, uh, so he talks about the first Adam, the last Adam. Uh, he talks about the uh, first man, that is Adam, and he talks about the other man, that is uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's very interesting thought that uh, you know Paul presents in these verses in twelve to twenty-one. Uh, this passage is very unique because Paul does not write or mention anywhere else in Scripture about this. A little bit is mentioned, as I said, in First Corinthians fifteen, but what Paul mentions here, uh, he builds on this in Romans chapter six on how it affects the believers today. So let's look at uh, verses, uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 19. Uh, can somebody read that, please? Verses 12 to 19. Ma'am, shall I read? Uh, can you just read verse 12, and we'll take it verse by verse then? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Thank you, Rupa. So sin came through Adam and death came through sin because we know that the wages of sin is death. So between sin and death, that means we begin to sin and we live our life, a whole life to be dead, we, are, we die, um, you know, we face all kinds of problems. We face sickness, disease, demonic afflictions, tribulations, difficulties. And he says that, you know, uh, because of sin, death spread to all men because all have sinned and the sin came through one man uh, has affected everyone sin came through adam it affected everyone so um, the consequence of adam's sin has spread to everyone so that's what he says in verse 12 verse 13 can somebody read that please for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law Thank you, Asha. So sin was in the world, you know, Paul is saying sin was in the world, but people did not realize it. You know, when did they realize that what they're doing is sin, that they're missing God's mark, that they're stepping out of their boundaries? It's when the law was given. When the law was given, it made sin visible because law showed them what is right and wrong and law showed them when they uh, have broken uh, the law when they have sinned, when they've gone away, and when they have are doing the right thing. So sin could not be held against people until the law came. But sin was there even before the law was given. And after law, you know, sin could be accounted for. It can it could in one sense be held against the people. That means we can say, hey man, you've uh, you've sinned, you know, this is what's in the law, but you've done exactly the opposite. You've broken, um, you've sinned, you've done something that's wrong. So, you know, sin was there even before the law was given, but after the law was given, sin could be accounted for or it could be held against people. Okay. Verse 14, can somebody read that, please? I'll read. But from the time of Adam, the time of Moses, they ruled over all mankind, even over those who did not sin in the same way that Adam did when he disobeyed God's command. Adam was a figure of the one who was to come. Thank you, Kennedy. So Paul is saying death reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay, law came through Moses. 
uh, then the people realize that sin is held against them, sin is accounted for because of the law. So even though they did not sin like Adam sinned, which means Adam was given an explicit or a specific command that he disobeyed, uh, and sin came because of that disobedience, and uh, as a result of that came death. So sin and death passed on to everyone even before the law. So even though we don't have any specific command like Adam, God gave Adam, yet we have, you know, all sinned and that has reigned over all of us because, you know, uh, because Adam sinned, you know, we have, um, we're all born in, in, in sin. And, um, and the law is there to show us that, you know, that we have sinned, that we have missed God's mark, that we've gone against uh, what he's asking us to do. And he says here that Adam, who is a type or a shadow or an example of him who was to come. So someone who is going to come in reality, uh, someone who is much bigger and greater, uh, that is Jesus, uh, who's going to come as a real man, you know, um, and there is some resemblance here. What came through one man affected many, and what comes to the second man also affects many. Okay, so what's the resemblance here is sin came and death came through uh, Adam because Adam sinned and as a result of that the death came but um, and it affected all of us, okay, in the same way the second man, as Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, what he brought, came to bring us, you know, it affects everyone who believes in him. So this is a resemblance he's going to point out uh, in the rest of this uh, chapter. Okay, so can somebody read verse 15, please? I'll read. But the two are not the same, because God's free gift is not like Adam's. Adam's sin. It is true that many people died because of the sin of the one man, but God's grace is much greater. So is the free gift to so many people through the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. Thank, Thank you. you. So the first man, which is Adam, you know, he brought trespass, he brought offense, he brought sin into this world. Um, and the second man, or the last Adam, which is referring to Jesus Christ, brings the free gift. So the offense of the first man, that is the offense of Adam, brought death. But the gift of the last Adam, that is Jesus Christ, brings the grace of God, uh, which is abounding to many. Okay, so he's actually bringing a contrast, a difference between the first man and uh, the first Adam and the last Adam. First Adam is talking about Adam, last Adam is referring to Jesus Christ. And verse 16 says, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So Paul is saying here the free gift came. Uh, Though there was much sin, you know, the free gift came, it brought about, what was the result of that? It brought about justification. But through Adam, you know, uh, what was the result of Adam's sin? It brought about condemnation. But through Jesus Christ, you know, we are justified by faith. We are made righteous in God's sight. Okay. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, how much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So he's saying here that, you know, through one man's offense, it brought death to everyone. Adam's sin brought death to everyone. It brought condemnation to everyone. Um, reign means, you know, death ruled over everyone. Because of Adam, we were made slaves to everything that came as a result to sin. But through Jesus, we received the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. So what will happen as a result of this? You know, he says, we'll reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Okay, so the grace of God and the righteousness of God puts us in a position to reign, to rule in life. 
We are in a position to rule over everything that Adam has made us a slave to. Can we say an amen to that? You know, God has put us in a position, you know, in a powerful position that we can reign and rule, have dominion over everything that Adam has made us a slave to. So in this life, you know, the life that we're living, you know, you and I have mastery, we have authority, we have dominion over everything that Adam has made us a slave to because we have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Amen. Okay. So just want you to just want to leave us with this uh, note. We'll continue with verses 18 uh, to the end of the chapter on Friday. But uh, just see how beautifully Paul just brings about. He says, you know, you were uh, uh, enemies with God. Uh, you, uh, you know, you were weak. Uh, you had no strength. Uh, you were sinful. Uh, you were powerless. Uh, but see what the grace of God has brought us. The grace of God has, um, the right and the righteousness of God has put us in a position, uh, you know, where we have peace with God. We have standing in grace. And as a result of that, we saw all the benefits of how God sees us because of our standing in grace. And we also have a position to rule, uh, not to rule just in his kingdom, uh, but to rule over everything that Adam has made us a slave to. So we have mastery, we have dominion, we have authority over everything that Adam has made us a slave to because of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness as we have received because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Okay. Any questions anyone has? Any questions? Just a few more verses and then we'll end this chapter. No questions? Okay, so um, we finished chapters 1 to 4, so we can have our first assessment test. Is that okay? We have our first assessment test. All of you are okay with that? Okay, um, so can we have it on a Monday? Is that fine? Monday. Sorry? Next Monday, ma'am. Uh, is next Monday okay with all of you or you want uh, some more time? I have an uh, assessment schedule for uh, second years on the uh, second Monday. That is, uh, I think, 12th of uh, September. So, which date would be fine for all of you? This Monday, coming Monday, will be 5th, 12th, then this 19th. This 19th, okay with all of you? Not on yes, Monday? Yes, 19th. Oh, what is the format of this assessment test, uh, Pastor? Uh, it's a yeah. test. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Christopher. Can you please say that again? No, I was just saying. Uh, what is the format of this uh, of this test? How 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 is it going to be administered? Is it like a written test, um, multiple choice? What what is how is it how is it going to be done? Yeah, it's uh, basically will be multiple choice, and I'll put it on the Google Classroom. Uh, and so you can just tick the right options. I can even give you fill in the blanks or uh, true and false, but it will basically be multiple options which you have to choose the right uh, uh, options or choose the wrong options, anyone. And it's an open book. So is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Not much of true and false and fill in the blanks, but I usually give uh, multiple choice so that, you know, the, uh, and the, the whole purpose of having um, this assessment is so that, you know, uh, just, you know, gather information, how well you've understood, perceived uh, Romans, also for you, all of you to go through the notes uh, and also listen to the lecture notes, because if you're uh, following me, you would have noticed that I'm saying a lot of things that is not there in the notes and not just following the notes. 
per se, but you know, uh, including a lot of things which I will also be putting part. Uh, you know, I will also including that in the in the multiple options. So uh, you'll have to go through your notes, and also I hope you have made notes, uh, your own notes, lecture notes, so that uh, it'll be also part of what I have taught in class, and also the notes. Not going to be too different, but a couple of things that I said. Uh, which I give you extra information, which I will also include. So is that okay? Uh, then we'll go with September 19th. Is that fine with everyone? Monday? Yes, okay. Okay, most of them in favor. Okay. Thank you all for responding. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Rupa. Okay, thank you all. Sorry for taking extra six minutes. Um, have a wonderful day. And God bless all of you. Thank you.